Various sorts of social insurance programs have been around since the introduction of the modern nation-state, but the first compulsory social insurance programs, which encompassed an entire nation rather than just portions of a state, were deployed in 1883 in Otto von Bismarck's Germany. Initially, folks living in Germany at this time were incorporated into a national health insurance scheme, which was followed by workers' compensation and old age and injury schemes in 1884 and 1889, respectively. This concept worked well enough that it soon spread to neighboring European countries, and ultimately across the channel to Great Britain as well, which introduced a compulsory national health insurance scheme in 1911, which in turn furthered the deployment of these sorts of programs across Europe and then the larger Western world. At a fundamental level, social insurance programs are meant to spread risk around, which is what insurance of any kind is for, as when you pay a monthly insurance premium to protect your car or home, you're paying a small amount so that if something really catastrophic happens to your car or home, that larger payment will be covered by your insurance. In this way, all the folks paying into these programs with those relatively low regular payments are paying the larger bills of the people who have the misfortune to have their homes burned down or cars demolished in an accident. Social insurance works the same way in that the people to whom it applies pay a little bit on a regular basis and then get a big payout if and when the right variables change. They get sick or injured, they become too old to work, etc. But the fact that it's generally compulsory, meaning everyone has to participate in it with few exceptions, means the pool of money available to pay for those bad luck situations is much larger than is the case for even very large private insurance companies. That means these programs can apply broadly and afford to handle all sorts of otherwise too cumbersome situations, like, for instance, sending regular checks to everyone above a certain age in a given country for the rest of their lives. These programs proved beneficial enough in terms of providing a social safety net for folks who lose their jobs or otherwise can't earn a living themselves, and in terms of keeping people on average more healthy and helping them reach higher levels of education and economic achievement, that much of the world adopted some version of them throughout the 20th century, especially post-World War I. These programs were then broadly amplified, increased in scope and scale post-World War II as a new modern global order began to coalesce and international trade made competition with not just one's immediate neighbors, but every single nation on the planet a more pressing imperative. Nations that had populations that were generally well-educated, healthy, and comfortable and confident in their government's ability to take care of them, at least compared to other comparable countries, had a latent advantage in this new global setup. So adoption and expansion of these programs became the name of the game, even within cultures that were branding themselves in direct opposition to top-down communist or socialist-leaning governments and policies. Through some lenses, these programs smacked of those vile enemy concepts, but they were nonetheless maintained, beloved, and further invested in, because they just had so many obvious benefits for everyone involved. What I'd like to talk about today is social insurance programs at a moment of economic unrest and widespread demographic change. <laughs> You're listening to Let's Know Things. I'm Colin Wright. Let's Know Things is an independent, listener-supported show. If you're enjoying what you hear, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things. But you can also support this and all of my work at understandery.com. Folks who support this show via either of those methods gain access to an additional episode of the show each month and an ad-free version of the show. A great big thanks to everybody who's already helping to support Let's Know Things, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. All right, let's get back to the show. 
article I'd like to start with today comes from the New York Times, and it's entitled, As Lawmakers Spar Over Social Security, Its Costs Are Rising Fast. In an age where politicians are endlessly seeking viral fame and usable sound bites for their next election campaign cycle, it's rare that a seated president scores any real points during their State of the Union address. A well-scripted, usually pretty formal, live televised speech in which they typically bang the drum for their own achievements and do their best to set the stage for the next year or so of their administration. Because of this format, generally the president in question is a sitting duck for breaches in decorum and for any nitpicky detail that can be pulled at, unraveling or seeming to unravel the larger narrative they're attempting to weave. Despite that, according to most nonpartisan analysts, U.S. President Biden was able to achieve a small strategic victory during his recent State of the Union speech when he said that Republicans are attempting to deplete funding for Social Security and Medicare, which led to catcalls and cries of liar from many Republican Congress people in attendance. He did this over and over, and was thus able to get these Republicans on camera to basically commit over and over to not cutting these programs, something some of them have stated they want to do, though the main concern was that Republican lawmakers would try to pitch cuts to these programs more privately and surreptitiously during negotiations about the government's debt ceiling increase, which needs to happen soon to avoid a default sometime this upcoming summer, but which is still a contentious topic as some Republicans believe those negotiations can serve as leverage to get a bunch of things they want, while others insist it's crazy to think of it that way, with the implication that Biden's administration will no doubt give them something on their wish list either way to make sure the process goes down smoothly. That debt ceiling conversation aside, though, this trick seems to have worked, which could spare Social Security and Medicare from the chopping block, despite their increasing economic unsustainability. The U.S. was a bit behind most other Western nations when it comes to the implementation of social insurance programs, but from 1935 onward, these sorts of programs took off, and as was the case in most other nations that adopted them, they filled in a lot of gaps that were left by capitalism and other methods of governance and managing the distribution of scarce resources, helping pull the U.S. out of the Great Depression and establishing a baseline standard of support citizens could expect from their country. And to be clear, the U.S. didn't even have a federal retirement program until 1939, which was when the idea that you would work for a long while, but then chill out and relax for a bit after a handful of decades came into being. The program was then expanded and expanded and expanded, both to incentivize productivity during the Second World War and because it was really just super popular to do so. So politicians figured out ways to make this happen for their constituents in order to benefit from that popularity. The impact of these programs has been vast in terms of overall health, in terms of professionalization and allowing people more mobility and power within the workforce, allowing businesses to flourish, saving lives, helping people have kids and raise those kids to be healthy adults, getting people education and post-education resources, providing food assistance and cash aid, and other such resources to people who need it when they need it. A lot of what we take for granted today is the consequence of these programs. But all that expansion eventually caught up with some governments, and in the U.S., the gargantuan level of spending associated with all these programs sparked a movement toward welfare reform, which culminated with the Welfare Reform Act of 1996, which among other things reduced the openness of these programs substantially, limiting them to people who really desperately needed them, though in practice that often meant people who could prove they desperately needed them prove in ways that were acceptable and legible to those running and providing oversight for these programs. The practical outcome of this period of reform was that you could no longer receive unemployment payments forever, and you needed to be actively seeking work and needed to be able to prove you were doing so in order to receive those payments, which were smaller than before as well. You also generally needed to live up to very specific standards to get childcare assistance and food stamps and other safety net related benefits that were previously more widely available and generous, 
this truncation related to fears about the cost of these programs, but also a sort of fairness argument that had become politically popular. Why should I work to pay for food and childcare when these people are just sitting around being lazy, getting the same on the government's dime? The incentives-based argument ultimately won out during this period, and these programs were cut and cut and cut again. And this happened in many countries, especially across the wealthy world, as part of a larger trend of austerity economics and policies. This was not a broadly popular sequence of events, and the results have been muddled. Some figures seem to show that employment went up and child poverty went down, and the incomes of families that were formerly on these programs for long periods increased by an average of 35% in the following decade. Others have pointed at how these program changes have been good for some, but have made life far more difficult for those stuck in deep poverty, while also tipping more people into that category. The number of people experiencing significant levels of poverty increasing across the U.S. by somewhere between 130 and 150 percent. This dynamic changed a little in 2013 with the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, sometimes gratefully or derisively called Obamacare. This act introduced subsidized medical insurance programs, which allowed many people to afford decent quality health insurance because the government paid for part of their premiums if they made below a certain level of income, while also boosting Medicaid coverage, allowing more people into the U.S.'s government-funded health care program. The Affordable Care Act was also very controversial when it first arrived on the scene, with the majority of Americans opposing it, but it has in the years since become quite popular with a majority of Americans, despite Republican politicians often using it as a punching bag during campaign season. The Social Security program in the U.S., which is basically an unemployment insurance program that makes regular payments to people who are above a certain age, or those who are unable to work because of a disability or other such attribute, is also broadly popular, especially with folks ages 62 and older who receive these payments for the rest of their lives post-retirement. This program is funded primarily by funds collected from employers while these people are in the workforce. So if you're being sent social security checks, those checks were paid for, ostensibly at least, by money that was taken out of your paycheck during your prime employment years. The trouble with this setup is that it makes sense if the same number of people are born in each new generation, and if they earn money in the same way as their grandparents. But that's simply not the way things work. Norms change. Population figures change. Further, because people are living longer than they used to, for all sorts of wonderful technological, medical, and systemic reasons, that means these sorts of payments are made for longer and longer, which means the math used to figure out the size of said payments, both what's paid out and what's paid into the program while people are still working, no longer add up. They're based on old assumptions that have people dying on average sooner. The same is broadly true of Medicare, which is the social health insurance program folks who are retired or otherwise not able to work benefit from, again on the government's dime. These programs are beloved and by all indications incredibly successful in terms of what they provide, but monetarily, the writing is on the wall that something is going to need to change, and no politician wants to be the one in office when those changes finally happen. Hence, Biden is protecting these programs, even though he knows, as does his party, that this is a serious issue that will need to be dealt with eventually. Thus, proposals from both parties have been tossed into the conversation over the past handful of years to see if anything sticks. During his 2020 presidential campaign, Biden proposed raising taxes on the highest earners to shore up these programs' finances and to increase benefits for some retirees, while some Republicans have proposed spending cuts and or slowly raising the retirement age from 62 to 67, which would both save money and account for our increasing average life expectancy. Neither of those directions seemed to be politically viable, and no option that has been proposed by people in the position to do anything about it has yet been popular enough to become a cornerstone of either party's political messaging. So we've got popular and beneficial, but unsustainable economically, systems, and no obvious way to make them more sustainable while maintaining that popularity and benefit. This is not, I should note, a problem that is unique to the United States. 
Governments around the world are struggling with what to do about their social insurance programs, as these things have arguably helped them in countless ways over the past several generations. But there are also drains on public finances. And if those numbers don't balance for long enough, and your population and system are not comfortable with the idea of social policies more broadly, as is the case with many Nordic countries, for instance, which are generally happy to spend a huge percentage of their resources keeping everyone healthy and educated and such, and have built their economic systems to account for that preference. But in other non-Nordic systems, folks typically eventually become uncomfortable with those unbalanced books, these things that do not pay for themselves. In France right now, President Macron has been struggling with protests that are attracting hundreds of thousands of people who are angry about government plans to reform the pension system, which would have the practical effect of raising the pension age from 62 to 64, meaning you would have to work two more years before being able to retire and receive a pension. And protesters have not leveraged their ability to strike on a broad scale yet, but small strikes within specific industries have already resulted in a lot of tumult throughout France, and it's expected that if Macron doesn't back down or change the plan in some way, that could be the next phase of pushback against this plan. The Chinese government is also seeing protests related to proposed cuts to government-provided medical insurance for seniors. Those cuts the consequence of high levels of spending by the government during the recently dropped COVID-0 lockdowns, alongside a broader economic downturn resulting from those lockdowns and from the country's disconnection with some aspects of the global market. So these elements have combined to cut income and increase spending simultaneously, leaving government coffers federally and locally, a lot less full than they would typically be. As tends to be the case in China, these protests were broken up quickly and information about them was stricken from the local internet. But this shows that this is not just a capitalistic Western issue. All sorts of governments are struggling with investments in these sorts of programs as their costs go up because more people are living longer. While in parallel, government incomes are going down because of things like pandemics and changing demographics, which leave a country with fewer young people in the workforce actively paying into these social insurance systems. It's exactly that lopsided dynamic that led a Yale professor to ask, apparently jokingly, with the intent of challenging the existing order via comical exaggeration, why Japanese elders don't just commit widespread ritual suicide, as that would seem to solve many of the country's problems basically overnight. This comment struck a negative chord in Japan, where many of the higher positions of leadership in the government and businesses are held by elderly people, but where the system, like in the US and China, is also increasingly top-heavy, with those older people soaking up a disproportionate amount of public resources and wealth via these social programs, while the younger people at the bottom are charged increasingly more, are increasingly unable to attain wealth because it's held by those elders, and are thus increasingly pessimistic about about their chances of ever benefiting from those same services, because it's likely these systems will be bankrupt before they come of age. This, in turn, has been presented as one of the many reasons young people in wealthier countries are having fewer kids than previous generations. The systems in which they exist are rigged, in a sense. They don't incentivize them to have a family, because these systems are so out of whack and unbalanced in their elders' favor. Wherever you go, these programs are expensive. In the U.S., just Medicare spending, without any of the other programs included, is expected to cost about $1.6 trillion by 2033, which would be more than 4% of the entire U.S. economy's output. There are only so many ways to pay for these sorts of systems in a way that allows them to continue to exist long term. And all of them, the ones that have been proposed so far anyway, are unpopular with large segments of the relevant decision-making population.
you're enjoying Let's Know Things, consider becoming a supporter. The simplest way to do that is to become a patron at patreon.com slash let's know things, or you can become a member at understandery.com. Folks who support this show via either of those methods gain access to an ad-free version of the show and an additional episode each month. A great big thanks to everyone who's already helping to support this show, and thank you in advance if you're considering doing so in the future. The book I'd like to recommend today is called What If 2? Additional Serious Scientific Answers to Absurd Hypothetical Questions by Randall Monroe. Among other things, the author of this book is the creator, the cartoonist behind the webcomic XKCD, which some of you have probably never heard of, and some of you, if you've heard of it, and if you've seen it regularly and recognize the little, at times, single-frame stick figure drawings, probably love it as much as I do. For the folks it's aimed at, it is just a pitch-perfect cartoon. This book is similar in terms of the type of comedy utilized, but different in terms of topic. Rather than being primarily developer and engineering and science-related jokes, this is a book full of questions that are often just absurd on their face, but which he then goes through and attempts to answer in the most serious and science and numbers backed way possible. And those serious answers then become kind of funny unto themselves because of how patently absurd the questions are and thus how wild some of the numbers are and some of the solutions proposed are. But that is why it is such a delightful book to read. There is a first What If book as well, but I'm intending to pick it up at some point because this one is full of so many interesting thought experiments and just seeing how somebody like Monroe deals with these types of questions, figuring out ways to answer things that would seem to have no answers, that is a useful exercise unto itself alongside the entertainment value of the answers that he ultimately provides. Now, if any of that sounds interesting to you, consider picking up a copy of What If 2 by Randall Monroe. You can find out more about me and my work at colin.io. You can find the show notes and transcript of this and every episode of the podcast at letsknowthings.com. You can find my other news-focused publications and podcasts at onesentencenews.com and notesonthenews.com. And feel free to reach out and say howdy on social media. I'm Colin Wright on Facebook and YouTube, and at Colin is my name on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so very much for listening. I'm Colin Wright, and I'll talk to you again next week.